Hey everyone, Parthi here from the uh, Letter Drop team. Welcome to the podcast. Today we have John Henry Shirk. Um, he goes by JH. Uh, we've had the pleasure to of sort of just like following each other on Twitter and LinkedIn and just have, and I, I've really enjoyed um, a lot of JH's like takes. Um, I also got to meet each other actually in person a couple of weeks ago in uh, New York at a conference. And I think what I really appreciate about JH is like, he's really thinking critically about how like the game is changing in B2B marketing. Um, he runs an, an SEO agency, Growth Plays, that works with a lot of names that you've probably heard of before, like uh, Lattice and Launch Darkly. Uh, but he's not just kind of like sitting on the, oh, like here's how things have been done for the past 10 years and here's how we're going to keep doing things. But he, I, I like a lot of his commentary on how um, the world is changing and how you need to think about adapting to that as well. And so that's something that I'm hoping to dive into deeper um, on today's episode. Um, but yeah, welcome to the show. Parthi, thank you so much for having me. Great, great. And that's probably the nicest introduction I've ever gotten. <laughs> uh, it's it's definitely warranted. So uh, you can thank your online presence for that, for sure. Um, let's actually jump into it. So um, how long have you been running Growth Plays right now? I think going on like seven years now. So started uh, freelancing and then building a team over time. Um, got really lucky and started working with um, some some fairly large companies early out the gate, just due to living in San Francisco, knowing folks at that company, at those companies, and um, you know, also started working like a mix of startups. So I was able to see sort of early stage and later stage side by side early on. And I'd say we've geared more toward uh, the later stage needs as we've grown. That's really like I'd say where, where our sweet spot is and where we like to play, like pre IPO or or public companies. Gotcha. And so. For those later stage companies, tell me a little bit more about uh, what's what's sort of the playbook for like a later stage company. So let's say um, we're a business that has done our sort of like nominal investment SEO. We have some qualified traffic coming in pretty regularly. Let's say we've done all like the basic obvious stuff. It's just like, oh yeah, us versus our competition or best tools and category for like niche use case and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we're really not quite sure where to go from there. Does that sort of like map to like uh, the companies um, you're helping out when, when you come in or, or have they done something different uh, before that point? You know, I hate this answer, but it really depends on the company and their space and how important search is to their space, whether it's like they're very sales focused, they're reaching sort of a, like a limited TAM and it's like, there's not that many companies they can sell into. If it's like a product for banks or like large banks, it's like, you know, maybe SEO hasn't been that important to them. Or it's like, we worked with one company where, yeah, it was a product for banks. And it was like, they had maybe 200 different companies they could sell into like banks and financial services, larger ones where the standards in the market couldn't scale to what they needed to. So it was like, high volume, high velocity. And for them, like SEO is a thing to do. Icing on the cake could bring in a few more accounts potentially every year and more honestly doubling down on sort of like a, let's make this work for search, but let's also make this work as sales enablement. So like in that space, like SEO really has just was not in there. It was not a considered initiative for their entire time as a company. Other times we come into companies that they've been doing SEO for like 10 plus years. And SEO has changed so much that they almost have this like, I don't want to call it like content decay or like content dead or anything like that. Cause it's not just about like the content being off. It's like the entire road where they're like, let's pick a keyword. Let's go for that thing. And let's just like hammer that. And I think it's about like one adjusting the mindset inside the company. Of how do we approach the channel? How do we do it? So it's not just about like, getting a lot of traffic for these high volume terms, but like, how does it really map to the buyer journey? And I think approaching it more of like a way to feed into demand gen and like making a very clear path from like, here's these visits, here's the problems it's probably solving. Like, yes, there is this top of funnel, what is educational component for people who just need a quick definition, but what are all the problems that we solve and how can we find those people that maybe don't know how to articulate their problem? but they are searching for this topic in a broad manner and then send them into things that are just like not SEO relevant at all. Maybe they're gated experiences, maybe they're a community, or maybe it's, you know, even just a simple white paper, but like, how do we make SEO not just a thing that generates a lot of activity or a lot of like hits on the website and really starts having a clear path to whether that's contacts in the CRM or downloads in Marketo or whatever, 
But I think um, companies that have been doing SEO for a really long time, because I mean, I've been I've been in SEO since 2009 or so, 2008, and back then it was just so non-competitive. Like just having a blog was like, oh wow, they're publishing, like that's a big deal. And now it's like you, it would be weird to not have anything, have a place to write content on your website. So I think like the bar has been perpetually raised in those companies. I'm not saying older companies don't raise the bar on their own. But there's always aspects of their like search and content initiative that have this sort of um, legacy relic aspect to it that needs to be modernized. So I'd say, honestly, I think it's easier starting from scratch versus coming into something and figuring out like how they've been doing things. What's the process of getting something done? How do they launch a new page? How do they decide what to focus on? And then trying to augment that to how the channels changed over time. I think there's a lot more complexity and nuance there. But um, the other thing is just like in every space, everything is always evolving. Every B2B company is always changing. And I think it's like, you can go for the very clear, direct, like, oh, okay, that keyword, like, yeah, Salesforce CRM. But I think like as a product evolves and as it serves more stakeholders and has more use cases, the content strategy needs to evolve with it. And oftentimes the company's focusing on like the one or two keywords that matter or like the things that they're most known for in the space, but maybe not like the things that can help bring in significantly more revenue um, outside of just like that one head term. So I'd say it's a lot of like, my, apologies here. I'd say it's a lot of like set adjustment and adjusting how the work actually gets done in those bigger companies. So in terms of, let's say you, you go into an organization, let's assume, like I know, I know there was the company which like really doesn't care about SEO or doesn't really have an opportunity around that. But let's say like there is a company which does have a, an opportunity around SEO. They're either PLG or um, like mid-market sales led and there's sufficient volume um, for, for people to, to actually like want to come to them organically through search. What is your sort of like diagnosis process and decision tree in terms of how they should approach things and what they should do in terms of like, okay, here is kind of like step one, step two, step three of how I'd approach that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, where I'd really want to start is figuring out like what their goal is right now and like how, and you said it's like PLG, but I'd be really curious, like how many hand raisers are in the market. And if there's like people that are actively looking for this thing and they're like, I need this cause I know how to use it. Or if it's more of like, we need to educate the market on how they can leverage this technology. And I'd say I'd, I'd approach things pretty differently, but where I typically start is like mapping the most relevant, like maybe say like 200 opportunities and figuring out like, what is it going to take to execute on these? How competitive is it? And like, what's the impact and effort to get this content out the door and to be able to get visibility for these terms. So it, it really maps to like, where is their product in terms of product market fit and just people knowing to how to buy the thing. And then where do we have opportunity that's feasible for us to be able to rank and what can we do that's relatively lower effort uh, first? Where they are in terms of product market fit, what are the most relevant opportunities and what can we get out the door kind of quickly with lower effort where we can get some visibility and kind of prove some, some, uh, some efficacy for the channel upfront. Getting wins on the board quickly is really important in the search. You need to prove like we know what we're doing, we can quickly get some wins and then also building out for the long term. So I'd almost want to start like two tracks, like what are our short term wins? What are our long term bets? And that's typically how I'd approach say like PLG has some semblance of product market fit. There are some people looking for the solution and lay out sort of a quick wins, long-term bets roadmap. So I guess the first thing to decide is like, is there like, does it even make sense for them to work with you? Like, is there even an SEO opportunity? I imagine the next thing to do is like, okay, given like your ACV, given how you go to market today, um, what exactly should you be focused on? And then, um, yeah, and then kind of like take it from there in terms of like how much investment is required. Yeah. So typically when we start working with a company, the way that we'd focus on is like one, where are you in terms of like product market fit? Like, are there hand raisers in the market? Are there people that are actively looking for your solution and know how to articulate like what it is and what it can do for them? Or is it more of like, you need to educate the market on how they can leverage your technology? Cause if that's the case, it's going to be hard for going for that sort of like bottom of the funnel or even like solution seeking content. You'd have to go more along the like pain points and education. But typically where we'd start, like, let's say you are, doesn't matter if you're sales led, doesn't matter if it's product led growth. 
if there are people that know how to buy your product, or if there are people that are looking for comparisons around your product or around competitors, I'd usually want to start with sort of that like battle card buyer enablement to kind of content, like alternatives versus things for SEO. And then also like solution seeking content, maybe that's trying to rank product pages. It also depends on like how much authority does the site have? Like, is it a site that's gotten a lot of press or is it kind of like a sleeper in the space that maybe people know about it, but it isn't very active online. So it doesn't have tons of links pointing to it. But either way, I'd start with mapping out, like what are the top 200 opportunities or so that we could go after? I'd wanna figure out how much traffic could that bring in? And then like, what would be like the impact and the effort to like the impact if we were able to like rank fairly well for the term and the effort to rank for it? Like, do you have to map the entire market and make a really in-depth buyer's guide and really know the space? Cause that's way tougher than just like cranking out solutions pages or making a blog post about the topic. Mm -hmm. So like how much product information does this, does this post require in order to be effective and actually help people solve their job to be done? I'd also want to figure out like, what's going to be like the cost of producing this content. Like if you are, I don't know, like a calendar scheduling tool, that's way easier to pump out and find freelancers who can write for you than say like a, a DevOps automation platform where you have like a lot of technical expertise needed just to be able to dabble in the space in terms of content production. So I'd say like, what's gonna be our cost of content getting out the door? What are our top opportunities? And what's gonna be the highest, the highest impact, lower effort to start? And I'd wanna really create a mix of what are our clear, like these will make money, these will convert, but maybe it's not gonna be a lot of traffic, but maybe it's gonna be like some, some, some like base hits and wins on the board. And what are maybe some like longer term bets or some things that we should go for for the future? I'd say it also to be pretty direct is also like, what is the appetite for leadership? Like if leadership is open to risk and taking bigger swings, I, I definitely would do that. We've worked with one company, uh, Fenella, fantastic brand. They have this really in-depth guide on taxation across the globe and have pages. They've got multiple pages for every country, depending on your needs. That was a really big bet that they made that like this would work. It would attract the right buyer. And they had to fully commit from, from day one, similar with like Gremlin. Uh, we worked with them on a chaos monkey sort of content library about like ways to use it, tutorials. It's super in-depth. It's really well designed. And that was, uh, like a, it was, I would say a home run, like when it launched, it got a lot of traction, it got a lot of links, it got a lot of write-ups. And that was like a bet. That was a risky bet as opposed to like dipping your toe in the water. And I'd say it's like, it's, you know, I am more on the side of like bold moves, get bold results. So I'd rather go big early on if we can, and like make some of those like bigger long-term bets, but it's also like, what's the culture of the company. And if the company's very much like, no, we want to iterate, test, try little things, and then invest over time, I try and sometimes push back on that and say like, we need to commit in order to see if this channel works. It's not like AdWord where you can spend a few hundred bucks a day and then figure out like, does this have value for us? But it, so I'd say I'm losing the thread here a little bit, but it really depends on what the company is willing to do. But I'd say I want to get a mix of like sure things and bets and the bets, how risky the bet is, is correlated to how risk tolerant or risk averse the company is. Gotcha. In terms of I think when people think like scaled SEO, and I see this across a lot of um, um, work with as well, they're just like doing like very traditional, like hub and spoke, um, like massive pillar pages and going after that type of stuff. And I know that kind of stuff has gotten increasingly competitive. A lot of that top of funnel stuff is probably going to get eaten up by AI modalities, right? Probably later this year, everybody has an LLM in their phone, um, your Siri or Google assistant powered by ChatGPT or Google, whatever is going to answer all of your sort of like high level questions for you. So there's this essentially, there's this type of content or like, like questions, which are no longer going to be searched, or at least they will be searched in a different way that where it doesn't make sense to go to a company for, or you're just like, Hey, like this is pretty common knowledge and AI that has the world's knowledge compressed can answer it reasonably well. So where does that leave companies in terms of thinking about how they should approach SEO moving forward? Hit me with the hard questions. I think that the, the, like what you're kind of talking about is sort of that like top of funnel, what is content? 
And I still think it's very valuable to define a concept because I think that you can still influence these LLMs. Like I, you know, I was talking to someone about this the other day. Like I'm not, I'm in the SEO game right now, but like long-term I'm in the helping people find information game. And I think these models will be able to be influenced. I'm not uh, exactly how to do that right now. I'm sort of in like the watch and learn mode, but um, I think that one, we're going to see less traffic from search over time, but I am betting that the traffic that we do get from search or from LLMs or whichever source people use to get information online is going to be more engaged because like the, what we have now in search with the featured snippet or the AI assisted answer in Google, it's pretty basic. Like if you really want to dive into a topic and learn and get to expert level or feel in very informed, you're going to need to go deeper. So I think I, my bet is that the visits that come to our site through LLMs or through uh, AI assisted answers and actually click through and read and engage, they're going to be the folks that you're actually educating. Like we've worked with a bunch of companies to rank for sort of these head terms. And the way I've described it is like for a technical term, like, yeah, it needs to, the content, we call it like the two audience concept. It's this idea of having like a basic quick definition or answer or solving the problem instantly. Like the second the person lands on the site, that person that just needs an answer. Like if I was explaining something like at, I don't know, Thanksgiving dinner, like, oh, uh, like product analytics. And my uncle wanted to just like go to the bathroom really quickly, Google what is product analytics and get like an answer. He's like, okay, now I understand what he's talking about. Like the content needs to work for that person, but it also needs people to pull in that engaged person who really wants to learn and send them down a pathway to self-educate. And I think that more and more of the visits are going to be that second audience, those people that are deeply engaged that really want to self-educate and learn. Because, you know, I know that LLMs are going to continue to evolve over time. Absolutely. There's no doubt there, but it's still fairly surface level. And even when I push these LLMs in today's state to go deeper and to get more specific and to answer questions that are technical, uh, more granularly, they don't always get me where I want to go. And I still have to go to the source material. And I think we're going to find that the source material is really important. Secondly, I think that there's like, not everyone wants to learn from like a Wikipedia esque infer- like type answer. And I think people are going to align to like personalities in the space. And we're going to see a bigger rise in, in like, not necessarily like B2B creators. I think that's a very um, like overused term, but I think that people want to learn from people that they trust and aspire to be like, and that we're going to see a bigger push towards like, what does this person think about the topic or what does this brand think about the topic versus like, what does this topic mean? And so I think we're going to look for more like flavors and takes and angles around information versus just like getting in, getting a, a like a, a non-biased answer from a Wikipedia type style. L. I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, I'm observing that most companies don't have the appetite um, to actually apply themselves and create that type of content or answer those types of questions. Um, if you look at our own blog, there's a lot of video, like, heck, I'm going to take answers from this podcast and I'm going to figure out like, how does this fit into like content we want to put on our blog, social media, whatever. It's just like two people who are very deep into a space talking about something at a fairly granular level, which I'm sure is helpful to a lot of people. Um, I think the median company thinks about SEO or content today. Uh, hey, here's something that I completely outsource. I don't have to do anything. I'm just like, give it away. Like they don't really, there's a, a writer who has no context about your business has no access to an expert at your company. There's this question of, do you even have, as a marketing team internally, do you even have access to the right experts? Do you like know the product management team? Do you know like your customers well enough? Do you know your partners well enough? And so how do you feel like companies should get around this? How do you think they should get more comfortable with thinking about, okay, how do we actually produce answers to answer the search intent in a way that is strictly superior to what an LLM can do, because I think that's really where there's value anymore. Um, the rest of the stuff is going to be sort of, um, cannibalized by LLMs for sure, for sure. Yeah, man. Uh, what you just said makes me think of this quote and I do not remember who said it, but it's like, uh, whatever you are, be a good one. And I, I, I totally hear you. Like we come into companies or we'll be on a sales call with a company and they'll explain like their SEO process. And it's like, okay, we pick a keyword, we show it off to a freelancer. They put it into like a tool, it gets a certain score. We publish it. And then like, it's just this like very outsourced commoditized way of producing content. And if you go, send it to an executive, like we, we work with one company and we just had someone on their DevRel team, like go through their top 20 posts and be like, 
what do you hate about this? Like, what is lacking here that, like, would make you bounce? Like, what makes you cringe? Like, what's bad? And they were like, yeah, like, I wouldn't say that. Or, like, this analogy doesn't really make sense. Or this just seems off. And it's not really how the space gets talked about anymore. And I think it's funny because, like, search, and you look in any company's Google Analytics, there's a ton of direct traffic, a ton of organic search traffic, usually, for, like, later stage companies. A lot of paid traffic as well. But, like, organic search is usually, like, number one or number two on the sources. But the way that we want to scale it up is by like getting the least involved people with the lowest amount of familiarity with the product producing all the content. And I think it's because search was this very tactic focused channel for a long time. It's like get like produce the articles, get the links, optimize the title tags, go, go, go. But there wasn't a bigger thought about like, how do we incorporate how we think about the space into this? Like what's our overarching message or like how do we use this as a platform for thought leadership? or product marketing, or how do we tie this to demand gen? And it's literally like a very, a lot of companies we talk to and we try and kind of break this mindset is just like, what is the, like the volume that we're publishing? Like how many pieces? and it's like, yes, cadence matters, velocity matters. But like, if you publish 200 pieces of mid content, that is not going to compare to like the one person who publishes 20 bangers a year. Like if you can get, if you can demand attention, online through what you publish because it's so good, then you will uh, really actually like develop an audience, develop trust versus just like being fodder for cert. And I think there's a way to kind of make your content play well for an algorithm while still having something unique to say that showcases your brand or your product or your vision on the space. And that's, that requires effort and companies like these later stage companies are so spread thin. And they're trying to do so many different things that it's often like a matter of like resourcing. But if you make the case of like, listen, this is where most of your traffic's coming from. Like this article that you didn't put that much effort into, it's getting 6,000 visits a month. Why don't we care about making this better and making it something that actually like really shows people how we're different and what we think. So I think there's like a, this commoditized approach to one like going after search, but there's also this approach that like traffic is a commodity and like, our website works as this like machine that harvests value out of the internet, but it's not, that's not really how it works. At least not how I think of it. It's like, there's a very clear path to becoming a customer and to developing loyalty and trust over time. And by cluttering up your website with sort of like lower quality, mid-grade articles produced by people who don't know your brand, don't know your product and don't know your space and are just kind of mishmashing other parts of the web that they see and being like, oh, this is kind of what ranks. I think it's really like doing a disservice to really people who could potentially become customers. Cause when you look in like say HubSpot and you look at like, what's that activity flow? It's like, okay, they came through this article and then they came back to the website, came back to the homepage a few times and then they converted. But if it's like, if the first thing they touch is just like garbage that doesn't help them, what's the chance that they're going to be coming back again and again. I agree with that. I think the problem here is, is that everything we just described is work. And then at the, uh, if there's anything that's true about human nature, it's just avoiding work and like taking the like easiest possible path. Right. And so I think there are worlds in which where like distribution is easier, uh, with like paid, like there's only so many ways in which your creative is going to say like book a demo. Um, and so people feel more comfortable, especially when the money faucet is on for a company, um, to say like, Hey, like this is the thing that we want to do versus, hey, here's a thing that probably over a six month period or a 12 month period is gonna be way better for us, like lower CAC, uh, repeatable, like higher qualified leads. Uh, but the blocking factor is that we have to think and apply ourselves. And uh, that's something that nobody at the company wants to do right now. So I think I think that's that's kind of like the, the, the challenge I see a lot of companies doing. And so I think leadership um, needs to like have like a very firm hand in this and say like, Hey, uh, we are going to try to do the right thing here just because we know like these short-term games are, are really not going to work for us long-term. But, um, I'm curious as to how, like you've had that conversation with people before. Yeah. I mean, I mean, all, like, I don't know. It's, it's so easy to say this is an agency owner. And it's like when you're actually faced with like looking at a company's culture and their DNA and you're like, Hey, like you actually need to like do real work here. It's very tough to, and like, well, I have 15 other things to do. And actually I'm in six hours of meetings all day. But I think like the other thing that we fight is um, the Peter principle of like people who are really good at like production level content work in a B 
B2B, com- they quickly get promoted to like director of content and then they're not producing that content anymore. Now they're like managing a pool of freelancers and trying to get other people to do what they could do at their level. When really it's like, no, like they are a phenomenal IC and it's like losing them is tough. And I think like it's, and I, I think that's why there is this push to like use B2B creators because it's like, well, they really shine at that. And that's like a, we know they're like kind of a guaranteed thing and they have a baked in audience, but it's really like letting that, that ability to produce effectively inside your company letting that flourish versus promoting that person to more of like a leadership role is it's not really something that we get to weigh in on, but it's something that I see as like an issue of like, well, I know that person can produce great work, but now it's like they manage a team and they manage vendors and they're not actually in a production role anymore. But um, I hear you like real work is hard. I often say like real work is grinding and it's like sitting down and like doing it. And I've definitely early on in my career, I just, I didn't get that. And I didn't understand like why, if I went in on a Saturday and just sat down for like six hours, I was like, oh, now I have something that can like really work. And it's because I was so interrupted. And I think it's also about like companies making time for people to create versus being in meetings all day. Like I try, I don't always do this, but I try and schedule all my meetings in the afternoon. And that way I can just have like a morning to actually do deep work and create. And I have like, I've used a service called Flow Club that's fantastic. That just is like blocked time to sit down and focus. And I think a lot of our work today is like interruptive, hard to do. So it's like, let's just give it to like someone who isn't on company time, isn't involved in meetings, and they can just like get it out the door because I'm too busy. So I think it's also about like enabling your team to have time to create um, versus just like being in and out of meetings and getting like a 30 minute block here and there to like sit down and respond to email. But I mean, I do like, this is a problem. And I think that's why a lot of companies lean on freelancers and end up paying a lot more to produce content over time because they don't create an environment where people who are creators can flourish and be productive. I agree with that. In terms of, I think uh, I saw this uh, sort of like thread from you where you were talking about how you're increasingly of the belief that, and I I think Winter Pep from Winter also posted something around this, like you want to be the first vendor that somebody thinks about uh, when they have a problem. And in many ways, um, I think about that maybe as like a demand generation or demand creation type problem. And I'm thinking to myself, like organic and display uh, or organic and paid uh, uh, ads essentially on on like social where somebody's not necessarily looking for something, but you are passively just putting out your message out there. And so that when they do come into market, they're like, okay, what's my consideration set? I've been hearing about these guys for the past six months. I'm, I'm definitely going to check that out amongst others. Um, and then they start searching for like alternatives to like that thing I heard and all that stuff. And that's where the SEO opportunity or like paid opportunities on search come in. Um, but I'm just curious as to you, you mentioned like, Hey, that's actually something you could create from an SEO perspective. So I'm curious as to how you think about that. Yeah. I mean, well, I'd say like, it's not, it, I don't want to frame it as just SEO. I think it's a lot of different things playing off of each other. SEO is one thing. Like someone, when someone has a question or needs a guide or is referential or trying to solve a problem, SEO can be a great fit. But I think also it's like social, having your audience do a lot of the work for you. Like in terms of getting away from SEO for a second, like we run on Notion as a company and I wanted to use Notion way before I was ever using Notion. I was like, I'm going to graduate to Notion. Like I'm going to get there. And um, because I saw how people were using it online. I saw examples of it. I saw videos of it. I saw how it could be used for various types of project management. And I was like, that's, that's what we need to move to. And I, and I was like, in my mind, I was like, oh, I'm going to get there. And then when I um, needed a cal- calendar link, I was like, oh, I'm just going to get Calendly. Like that's a brand I trust. Or like, and um, there, I think that there is a way to be found online when people have problems that map to like pre buyer journey of just like, I have these issues, I'm growing this type of business where you can help with those like very top of funnel things. Like for HubSpot, I think, wait, like in the 2010s, I downloaded like uh, business clip art from them or like business stock photos from them. And like, I use their CRM now. So it's like, I had basic, like I'm doing marketing work. I'm doing business work. I need these images. And that's how they got my email over time. But I think there's like very top of funnel things that are adjacent to what your buyer may need in the future, like what your future buyer needs now. And there's ways to get in front of them, whether that's like they're searching for, um, 
toolkit or resources and building some trust. Like it doesn't like it was it was a bunch of free clip art from Creative Commons. Like they didn't put a lot of work into building that. But it was something that was useful for me at the time and got me aware of their brand and it gave them my email. I think they eventually got my phone number and I eventually started getting calls when I was looking at their pricing page. So it's like there are ways to generate that awareness with search, but I think search in a silo is the wrong way to think about it. I think it's a lot of different things playing off of each other and search is one component. I Yeah, I think that's a really great way to think about it. It's, it's kind of like giving stuff away for free, like getting people in the door even when they're like way up in the funnel. And it might not necessarily directly be related to the product, but you're like kind of like your HubSpot example, but they're building that sort of like brand awareness. You have their damn logo on your template that you now download it. Very cool. Tell me a little bit more about how you think things are changing right now, even with uh, the way you're approaching helping your customers. I think uh, you could talk about um, a movement towards more like owned owned audience, right? Um, how is your offering changing? How is how you're thinking about SEO plus other things changing um, as well? Yeah. Um, well, it's a great question. I think one... We're doing a lot more content that is not necessarily related to a keyword. We find that we are really helpful at no matter what it is, keyword or not, mapping out what that content should look like and how it should live. Like we worked with one customer on like some gated content and helped them create a survey to run by their user base and it's been really effective for them. And it like did not align to a keyword. We found some other keywords that can funnel traffic to that content. But I think not just looking at content through the lens of search, but really like what do we want to produce and what's the right distribution channel for that? And how do we lead everything back to acquiring emails? And I, there's this movement right now around like ungating everything. Like buyers don't want to be gated. And it's like, well, I hear that. And for certain things, it can really make sense not gated. Like if you're confident that if you ungate it, that it's going to really take off and get a ton of like organic action, do it. Awesome. But if it's not the type of thing that people are going to run with and share and quote and cite, then I'd say like, I'm, I'm a big fan of gating stuff, like gating stuff. It's somewhat transactional because it's like, it's a very clear path of like attribution, but I think more so now than ever before marketers really need to prove their value and gating does allow you to do that. So I'd say one, like, and I, there's terms around like exclusive content or subscription content, but making it so like there's more opt-in and getting people to subscribe and really figuring out like, how do we tie this to, you know, I'm, I'm big on pushing like newsletters and sort of series right now, because so much of what our customers want to do, they're like, how do we make this work for search? I'm like, Hey, that's awesome. That's a great idea. And you should do it. But that does not work for search. Cause it's not some like referential information seeking concept. That's more like something you need to push on people. And it's great to promote that on social, but if you just give all your ideas to social and they float away in the ether, it's really hard to prove the value of that internally when you're asked like, what did you do this quarter? And I think like we give a lot of our content to LinkedIn and a lot of our content to Twitter, and I'm guilty of this too, because it's like a distribution machine. But I think really what we're trying to do is like, let's figure out how to distribute this and then pull everyone back and then get them to hang out with us for the long term by getting their email. So really trying to build like more, like I, I hate phrases like infotainment or anything like that, but like really trying to get people to want to hang out with us and opt into it versus like, hey, we get them to download this ebook and then we demand gen them into like a demo or to unsubscribing. Like getting more comfortable with having context hang out in the CRM for the long term and just kind of marinate on our ideas and get introduced to new studies and new research over time versus like, hey, if you are engaging with our website, if you're looking at this, like we are going to call you, we are going to email you, we are going to start sending you demo, like book a meeting now type emails. I think that's sort of a, an older term mindset and really letting people get educated over the long term until they're ready to buy. And I think like if they are showing buying triggers, like sure, reach out to them, try and get them on a call. But I think there's just this move of like, hey, we're down this month, like let's start sending out some demo request emails. And um, so really trying to like work with companies to get the ideas that they want out there in the world and then finding the right distribution channels for those ideas versus trying to just like make everything search or say like, Hey, this won't work. Go do it on your own. Like we're trying to get out of, um, out of our lane a little bit and figure out like we have this idea, what's the right format and what's the right way to distribute it. Yeah. And I think that also, I think a lot of people 
are almost like, oh yeah, like we don't need our blog anymore. Or uh, if, if we're not doing SEO, like we don't need our blog. And I'm like, your blog is great because for a couple of reasons, like A, um, it's just like this source of information, like sort like all this content that you own um, on your own domain that um, serves as an evergreen resource. You can always pull it, pull back to it. You can point people to it from social, from email, from your courses, from, from newsletters, from wherever back to it. Um, at this point in time with de-anonymization, like the clear bit type stuff, about 40% of your traffic visiting there without you having to gate anything, you can gate if you want, you can even identify like who's like which accounts are like hand raisers or like who's consuming what. And I feel like uh, when you when you run away from that, or if you're just like moving towards other sorts of um, mediums, like you just don't get the same level of like analytics or ownership, everything you're, you're kind of just operating on like rented property, which isn't a bad thing. I think a lot of these rented channels are really great for distribution. Um, it's in their best interest to like keep people around. And so um, getting you in front of uh, more people. But I do think that companies shouldn't necessarily abandon like like stuff that that, that lives on their website um, as well. Um, awesome. So this was this was a really great conversation, change. Is there anything that you want to maybe like put out in the world or like talk about? Like what's what's top of mind right now? Or if you could get one message out to the general B2B marketing community, like what would you want to say? One message that I have is like I, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, I really think we take the amount of traffic that comes to our website for granted. And I think the amount of traffic that's going to start flowing from these other sources, like we can even see like Twitter seems to be uh, showing less links to third party sites. Um, and then like with Google, they're clearly trying to maintain more traffic on their website to generate, you know, more ad clicks uh, with the move to like AI assisted answers. Um, LinkedIn definitely seems to like to keep people on the website. So I think like the value of a visit that comes to your website, regardless of what page it on is going way, way up. And you just talked about own media. Like, I think the idea of really thinking about not each visit is just like some hit that's a commodity, but like that's a potential account. And what can we do to capture that? And what can we do to keep people coming back instead of letting them just go back to the feeds and outsourcing sort of the, the audience development work to, to just having a following on LinkedIn or having a following on Twitter what can we do to really, really build a first party by leveraging channels like search and social? I think that's where we're going to go because over time, I think traffic is going to continue to decline probably uh, slowly at first and then faster over time. So I think really figuring out how to value each visit like we do from AdWords, because it's like, oh, it's $14 a click or $20 a click. There's a huge, clear, tangible value on that. But all that traffic coming from organic search or from social or from direct we kind of just treat it as like, oh yeah, it's, it's just there. And I think there's a real opportunity to try and maximize the value on that today. And I'm trying to push this, the customers that we work with to see that value more clearly. But I think that there's a real change coming and we take a lot of the traffic that we get today for granted. And the faster that we see the value on that traffic, the faster we're going to adopt to sort of like the, the new reality of how the web works and that there's less traffic coming from all these sources that have been driving a ton for a long time. Absolutely. I really love that. Last thing, if somebody wants to re is listening to this and they want to reach out to you, what's the best way to find you? Um, you know, I'd say you can go to growthplays.com and fill out the form if you want to chat, but um, I'm usually on Twitter, so you can find me there at JHT Shirk. Amazing. Thanks so much for joining us today, JH. I've learned a ton and um, yeah, really appreciate you sharing your insights. Awesome. Parthi, thank you so much, man. Um, hope that was helpful and really appreciate your takes as well, man. I wish I gave you a little bit more time.